Peter Stone received his BA in political science from Penn State University. He completed a senior honors thesis entitled Towards the Empowerment of Labor, the Allende Experience. He then entered postgraduate study in political science at the University of Rochester, receiving a master's and a PhD. His dissertation was entitled The Luck of the Draw, Revisiting the Lot as a Democratic Institution. From 2003 to 2010, he was assistant professor of political science at Stanford University. He then spent a year as faculty fellow at Tulane University Center for Ethics and Public Affairs before becoming a sure assistant professor of political science at Trinity College Dublin in the fall of 2011. Stone specializes in political theory, especially such areas as democratic theory, theories of justice, rational choice theory, and the philosophy of social science. He is particularly concerned with questions involving the scope and limits of human reason. He is the author of The Luck of the Draw, The Role of Lotteries in Decision Making, and the editor of Lotteries in Public Life, a reader. He has published articles in such peer-reviewed journals as the Journal of Political Philosophy, the Journal of Theoretical Politics, Politics, Philosophy and Economics, Rationality and Society, Social Science Information, Social Theory and Practice, and the Theory and Research in Education. He belongs to many professional societies, including the American Political Science Association, the Association for Political Theory, the Bertrand Russell Society, the Political Studies Association, and the Political Studies Association of Ireland. When not working on political science, he enjoys swing dancing, oh boy, the music of Leonard Cohen, and the occasional game of poker. So, I would like us all to give it up for Dr. Peter Stone. Thank you. Uh, this thing sounds like it's on. Is, that, is this working fine? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, I feel obliged, because of, uh, I'm in a gathering like this, to point out one thing about that lengthy list of credentials, just to make sure you got it. Um, you know, when I first moved to Ireland and they told me that my job title was going to be Usher Assistant Professor, I, my first thought was, okay, I'm an American, so I assume there was some rich guy named Mr. Usher who must have given them a lot of money. But no, I actually quickly learned, I mean, in a room full of humanists like this, some of you, someone in here must know who Bishop Usher Usher is. Yes, it's that Bishop Usher is the one, the, uh, the, who is a Trinity graduate, uh, the gentleman back in the 18th century who calculated from the, the ages of the prophets in the Old Testament that the earth uh, could, was, was 6,000 years old and that the Lord began the creation in October of 4004 BC. So that was my job title for my first, uh, first six years there. So, um, you know, that's uh, welcome to Ireland. What can I say? Anyway, um, so uh, as my biography suggests, most of my work is in uh, traditional areas of political theory, but one of the areas I have been working in on the side for a very long time uh, has been the uh, philosophy of Bertrand Russell. I've been a member of the Bertrand Russell Society for 25 years, uh, done a whole bunch of things as a part of that, and so uh, I am still remain kind of, even though I'm sort of not as focused on that as I have been in the past, very much uh, committed to trying to keep Russell's memory alive. And that's, you know, a task of some importance given that now Russell has been dead for 47 years now, I guess, actually. He died February 2nd, so it would have just been the 47th anniversary of his, uh, uh, 40, oh, 48th anniversary of his death just a few weeks ago. Um, and so one of the ways I try to uh, keep his memory alive is through a couple of books that I've recently edited. Uh, this is one of them. The, it's called Bertrand Russell Public Intellectual, uh, which is uh, d d doing very well. It actually won the Bertrand Russell Society's Book Award last year. And also a, d a more recent book called Bertrand Russell's Life and Legacy, which I don't have a copy of to wave in front of you uh, today. Uh, but I have a stack of flyers in the front for each book. If you're interested in this, I feel obliged to do the commercial announcement right in the up front, so you have that in front of you. But I also, in addition to writing about him, I enjoy giving talks like this. And whenever I give a talk like this, I try to think about uh, 
what it is I can say that would sort of, you know, uh, say why Russell is still important to be reading now after so long a time. He was for a time quite a very popular kind of figure, but he's kind of fading from view. So why should he not fade from view? What is it worth keeping? Uh, why is it worth keeping him uh, in living memory? And I think a good an answer to that question is to. Uh, talk about him, from, uh, there's a couple of different angles to talk about him from. The angle I'm going to take today is I want to talk about him uh, from the standpoint of the uh, amazing place that he had in our life and times. And a good way of getting at it is to get at all of the number of people that he is connected to in one way or another. Uh, the president of the Russell Society uh, right now, Tim Madigan, uh, with whom I've worked for a long time, uh, he's the one who sort of popularized the idea that, well, we should be playing a game called, you know, Six Degrees of Bertrand Russell, you know, instead of, uh, instead of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. And uh, uh, this, this is actually surprisingly interesting, the ways you can play this, the way you can play this game of connect him to different figures and all there. By the way, in case you're wondering, Bertrand Russell actually does have a Bacon number of three. And so if you want to know how he gets connected to Russell, it's in the book. So if you want to feel just, just in case you're wondering, you're on the fence whether or not to buy it there. That's among the wonderful things you can learn in there. Um, so here's, an ex here's some examples of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the kind of connections that you can make with Bertrand Russell. So a few years ago, I found myself doing some reading up on the 19th century artist uh, and intellectual William Morris. And some of you may have heard of William Morris. And so I got a book uh, out of the library. The library didn't have it themselves, so they had to go interlibrary loan to get me a copy of it. And uh, I found out that the book I was interested in was written by a, a very interesting guy named Colin Ward. Uh, who is a very interesting British anarchist. Uh, he wrote quite a lot of work in the late 20th century about anarchism. He's a, he's a very interesting uh, writer. Um, and I, as I dug into it, I learned a little bit more about Colin Ward. I learned Colin Ward's uh, wife, Harriet. Uh, her maiden name was Harriet Barry. And she's the daughter of a, a journalist named Griffin Barry and a woman named Dora Russell. Uh, Russell's second wife, Bertrand Russell's second wife. Uh, Bertrand and uh, Dora had a, an open relationship uh, in, uh, for their second marriage, uh, and Dora winds up having an affair with Griffin Barry and actually has two children with him while she's still married to Bertie. Bertie. This doesn't end well for the marriage, I should say. They're just, just you know, sp spoiler alert, you know, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't go well. Um, but, uh, but, you know, Harriet came out of it. She wrote it's a very interesting memoir, which I talk about in one of, the, uh, one of these books about, uh, about her, her father and all. So this is like, you know, this is going from, you know, contemporary anarchist thinker all the way back to Bertrand Russell. Um, so I gave a little more thought to this, and I said, okay, that connection to Russell was too easy. Can I come up with another one? So here's another connection from that same book about Bertrand Russell. Uh, where I, I, looked and I, I looked at the book and I said, okay, so where did my library get this book from? The answer is they got the book from the Fisk Kimball Library at the University of Virginia. Who is Fisk Kimball, you might ask? Um, Fisk Kimball was one of the first professors of art and architecture in the United States. It was like art was become, uh, teaching art and architecture was starting to become institutionalized at the beginning of the 20th century. So he was the first professor of that at the University of Virginia. After he had his time there, he went on to become the director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, while he was director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, he got into a long-running feud with a rather crazy millionaire art collector uh, named Dr. Albert Barnes. Uh, I don't know if people have heard of him. He's the creator of the Barnes Foundation, which is this amazing collection of impressionist art in Philadelphia. You know, there's a lot of uh, paintings by Cezanne, by, uh, by Matisse, uh, by Renoir, which, you're, you know, uh, which he has in his collection. And it's, it's an amazing resource. If you've never been there, uh, I highly recommend it if you're in, in Philadelphia. Uh, what's noteworthy about Barnes, Barnes was a very uh, cranky individual uh, who was involved in all kinds of feuds with people, but he was also totally committed to teaching people about art, to public education about the arts, and in particular, the idea that you needed to have a background uh, something in philosophy in order to properly appreciate art. You know, he wanted you to think about it, not just look at it. Um, and as part of that, he, taught all, uh, he had classes taught about philosophy at the Barnes Foundation. 
Well, guess who was one of the guys that he had teaching art at the Barnes Foundation? Yes, it would be Bertrand Russell. He actually hired Bertrand Russell to teach art, uh, teach about the history of philosophy at the Barnes Foundation. Uh, this would have been right after the famous case at City College of New York. It was a very famous case which some of you may know about in 1940 when Russell was uh, hired to teach philosophy at City College in New York and it raised an, an uproar with some of the more traditional religious people, especially Bishop Manning of the Episcopal Diocese of New York and there was a lawsuit in which uh, uh, cost Russell the job uh, as a result of that. Um, so Russell was about a job and Barnes came forth and said, hey, why don't you come teach at the foundation, you know. And then they wound up having a big feud, and Russell winds up suing Barnes, but that's a whole other story I could talk about. So anyway, um, the point of this is just that uh, it, if you get to know Russell, you start to find yourself getting to know a lot of other people. You start making all kinds of connections to all kinds of people in politics, in the world of literature, in the world of art, uh, in all kinds of areas of modern life. And he is, in that regard, I think, still a very excellent introduction to the intellectual world uh, that we still live in today. So for the rest of my talk here, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the other people in his life and some of, the, some of the interesting figures, and also some of the lessons I think that we can still learn by looking at Russell and these connections and his engagements with them. So... One figure that is definitely worth paying attention to if you talk about Russell uh, would be his grandfather. Uh, his grandfather, Lord John Russell. Uh, Russell was a, a coming from aristocracy. Uh, you know, like a lot, like most uh, British aristocrats, you know, he has a, a long kind of family line. But his grandfather was particularly noteworthy. His grandfather was a politician, longtime liberal politician. Uh, in fact, he was, as a young man, he had visited uh, Napoleon uh, at Elba when he was uh, in exile there. Uh, the journalist uh, Studs Terkel uh, did a wonderful interview with Bertrand Russell in the 1960s, where, which he called the man who shook the hand of the man who shook the hand of Napoleon. <laughs> I actually, we, we gave, the, uh, before he died, we gave Studs Terkel the Bertrand Russell Society's award. I actually gave, got to give him the award, so I, the award, and I got to shake his hand. So that makes me the man who shook the hand of, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so, so uh, Russell's uh, grandfather, a uh, longtime liberal uh, politician, uh, becomes prime minister twice, uh, becomes a somewhat infamous figure in my current uh, home of Ireland because he is the Prime Minister during what, the, the, what in Ireland they still call the Great Hunger, the Irish Famine. And uh, he is somewhat infamous as a figure in terms as one of the ones who was very much in charge when the policy of laissez-faire was being conducted and basically nothing was being done effectively to address the uh, widespread uh, hunger and, uh, uh, that was gripping Ireland uh, at the time. And uh, my friend Tim actually has a paper about this uh, tribunal that was held a few years ago, basically it was a tribunal sort of put Lord John Russell in the dock for like, you know, uh, crime, the crimes against Ireland there, you know, and examining the legacy of that. Uh, so another reason to buy the book. Anyway, uh, so you have Lord John Russell uh, and his memory. He dies when Russell is only six years old, uh, but his legacy looms very large over Russell, uh, you know, there, you know, he, he's Russell comes with a very strong sense of uh, personal responsibility. You know, the idea that you know you're coming from a family with a distinguished heritage, you have to live up to that. You have to make your contribution to society, uh, and sort of the, the what you might call the responsible wing of the ruling class. We're getting a pretty good dose of the irresponsible wing of the ruling class these days. Um, but the wing that said, you know, coming from an, uh, a wealthy aristocratic background meant, you know, having that sense of noblesse oblige, the saying you have to give back to society, you have a, a lot of responsibility. And that was definitely reflected in Russell, uh, how Russell was brought up. Uh, he was brought up by, uh, and tutored at home by uh, his fa grandparents' uh, family. His parents had died when he was very young, so he was brought up by his grandmother uh, primarily. Uh, he was sent to Cambridge, and the idea is he'd go to Cambridge, he'd study uh, economics there, uh, he'd learn about uh, world affairs, and then he'd get involved in politics, and he'd become a statesman just like his grandfather was. <laughs> 
Um, Russell, of course, had other ideas. Um, he decided that he was going to go into philosophy, uh, ultimately. But he never lost the connection to the world of politics, even when he goes into philosophy. He makes his name in philosophy as becoming one of the great, late, the great names in uh, the world of analytic philosophy. And I, I can talk more about that if you, uh, if you like. I'm going to sort of set that side of Russell uh, apart. That's getting into some of the more technical areas uh, of his achievement. But he never lost uh, contact with the world of politics. Uh, that always was the one that still fascinated him, that still uh, occupied a lot of his attention. Never quite in the same way that his grandparents probably would have been liked. Because if you know anything about Russell's politics, you know he was never particularly worried about how respectable uh, he was coming across in this regard. And in this regard, too, there is actually ample precedent in terms of, again, his family tradition. Uh, one of uh, the uh, Russell's ancestors, Russell had a lot of ancestors that he could point to and all, you know, all the way going back to the original ancestor of his, you know, his family ascends to aristocracy the way a lot of families did in, in England, you know. Um, he has an ancestor who's kind of close buddies with Henry VIII, uh, and right around the time that when Henry VIII breaks from the Catholic Church, and he's plundering all of the monasteries in England, seizing all of their property, and giving them out to his friends and allies, so it, it kind of pays to be close to Henry VIII at this time, and that's how his earliest ancestor becomes the, uh, the uh, first Earl of Bedford, or whatever, just from, from being in the right place at the right time. Um, um, but uh, he, Russell also had some other ancestors uh, who perhaps uh, cast a different light on the way of thinking about politics. One of them was a younger son of the sixth Earl of Bedford uh, who winds up taking part in something called the Rye House Plot. The Rye House Plot is a plot to assassinate uh, King Charles II and his brother James. Uh, Charles II is widely suspected of being a Catholic sympathizer, wanting to bring Catholic rule back to England, uh, and his brother James is a Catholic, you know, uh, overtly. And this is what results in the Glorious Revolution a few years later when William and Mary overthrow them. But uh, before that happens, there's this plot called the Rye House Plot. A lot of leading liberal families, liberal sympathizer families, uh, are conspiring uh, to assassinate uh, the king and his brother. And the plot is foiled, and a whole bunch of people, including one of Russell's ancestors, are executed for this. So Russell's got this long family history of statesmanship and all of that kind of thing, but he's also got this, fam this uh, family tradition of uh, being something of a rebel. Uh, his own father, uh, who died uh, when Russell was only four years old, uh, very much embodied this tradition as well. His father had actually embarked upon a political career in the mid-19th century. Uh, that political career came to an abrupt end because of a speech that he'd given uh, in support of contraception. So, um, yeah, that's not going to go over too big in mid-19th century England there and all of that. So he was, uh, you know, uh, this is a, definitely a family that is uh, willing to take a few risks. And even Russell's, uh, Russell's own grandparents, who were definitely the pinnacle of respectability in a lot of ways. I mean, again, grandfather was only a prime minister. He was an earl. An earl um, understood and accepted this need to take some risks in politics. When Russell was a teenager, uh, his grandmother, who was a very deeply religious woman, um, gave Russell a, a Bible as a gift, and she inscribed in the front of the Bible a few of her favorite Bible verses. And one of the verses that she inscribed in there was a, a verse from the book of Exodus, which said, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. And that was a line she very much lived by, and it was one that definitely Russell stood by. He didn't stay by the whole religion thing, as you know. He goes on, you know, he loses his religious faith as a teenager and becomes uh, an agnostic uh, for uh, the rest of his night life. But uh, the idea of not following a multitude to do evil is one that very much sticks with him. Uh, I want to move on to talk about some of the ways that he was a bit of a rebel in politics, uh, but I feel I, I can't resist telling one story about uh, one other leading figure uh, in lo looming over his life. It was another leading politician of the 19th century, a guy by the name of Gladstone. Uh, some of you will have heard of the great liberal prime minister Gladstone. Russell liked to tell the story that he met, Gla he liked to tell stories about Gladstone. He only met Gladstone once. 
It was after his grandfather was dead, and uh, Gladstone came to visit his grandmother, you know, as a, as a social call, and uh, came to dinner. They had a nice dinner together, and then, as was the custom, of course, after dinner, the uh, the ladies of the house retire to one room, you know, and whatever, and the men uh, they will stay and they will have their uh, they'll have their drinks and they'll have you know you know their their cigars and that kind of a thing, and so you know the uh, Gladstone is in the care of the eldest man of the household at the time, who is the 15-year-old Bertrand Russell at the time. So, uh, so Russell, 15-year-old Russell is in the presence of Gladstone, is this incredibly intimidating kind of figure. And he's sitting there, and he has absolutely nothing to say to Gladstone. And Gladstone, he said, said exactly one thing to him the entire night. He said, this is a very good port they've given me, but why did they give it to me in a claret glass? <laughs> and, Gla and Russell's just sitting there thinking, I just wish the earth would swallow me up right now. I like mentioning Gladstone because uh, one of the issues that's uh, much on the, uh, on the agenda in the world right now is how to deal with trolls. Um, and there's a wonderful story about, from Gladstone, I think, about how to deal with trolls that I have to relate. This is a story Russell liked to tell about Gladstone, so I feel like I, I justified in circulating it. So Gladstone, like I said, could be this very intimidating speaker. And uh, he was giving a public talk one time, and some of his political opponents had paid some uh, drunk guy off the street to go to the talk and heckle him. So Gladstone is giving his speech, and there's this drunk guy sitting in the back and giving, uh, his, uh, and periodically he's like, you know, interrupting Gladstone, yelling something out. And Gladstone is talking, and uh, he ignores him the first two times, or whatever, whatever, he interrupts him. And then the third time, he just fixes his glance on the guy, and he says, Will the gentleman in the back kindly grant to me that measure of courtesy, which were I in his position, and he in mine, I would most unhesitatingly grant to him. And the guy didn't say another word the entire time. So... So, taking some lessons where you can about how to deal with uh, how to deal with people like that. So, so as Russell uh, as Russell uh, grows up and becomes an adult, he remains very actively connected to politics, which gives him connections to a lot of other people, um, including a number of U.S. presidents. Um, as far as I know, he never met any of them in person. But he had a number of very interesting connections to some of our presidents. I mean, he had a lot of opportunities. I mean, this is some way of uh, getting a gauge of how large a, uh, an opportunity Russell had to be active because he lived to be 97. Uh, when he was born, the president of the United States was Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, when he died, the president of the United States was Richard Nixon. So that's a pretty good range when you think about it there, you know. Um, but one of the presidents he had a chance to interact with was uh, Woodrow Wilson. Um, Russell was very active in opposing the First World War. It was the, definitely one of those cases of not following a multitude to do evil. And as part of that, he was very anxious to see the United States not enter the First World War. The United States, as you know, was neutral for most of the war. They only entered the war in the last year or so. And he was very anxious to preserve U.S. neutrality. And he had been, uh, because of his anti-war activism, in particular his su militant support of this group called the No Conscription Fellowship, which was resisting the draft in, in Britain, um, he'd actually uh, had his passport uh, confiscated. He was not able to travel to the United States. And uh, so what he did was he arranged to have a letter of his smuggled out of the country with a young woman who was traveling to the United States, a letter to President Wilson, basically on behalf of the anti-war uh, movement in Britain saying, you know, the United States has a wonderful opportunity as a neutral country to mediate, to sort of try to find a peaceful way of bringing this kind of carnage uh, to a halt rather than joining in the carnage. Um, after the, uh, the uh, United States enters the war, uh, Russell writes a rather exasperated uh, editorial about this uh, in the anti-war publication that he edits. And it actually is a, it's something that actually winds up getting him uh, a, a six months in prison uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the war. So uh, uh, one of his other connections there. This is, the connections like this uh, to U.S. presence tend to be in the context of his anti-war work. This keeps going, for example, in the Cold War, when Russell is again very concerned about uh, the growing rival between, between the two major powers. Here, of course, he's interested in seeing Britain become the neutral country. He very much would have thought Britain should try to play the role as a neutral mediator between the Soviet Union and the United States to try to 
cool the co things down, keep the Cold War from becoming hot, and uh, find a way of building towards a more cooperative international order. And as a result of that, for example, he published an open letter to both uh, Eisenhower and Khrushchev in the 1950s in the New Statesman, basically calling for measures like this. And he famously got a response uh, sent to the New Statesman by Khrushchev. Khrushchev directly responded to Russell uh, there and uh, basically said that, yeah, you know, uh, of course, taking the sort of the uh, Russian party line in this, you know, saying that, look, we, we totally agree. We want, we want you know, to see peaceful competition between the major powers, not seeing it come to, uh, to war. And this uh, uh, in turn leads to another letter, not, not from Eisenhower, but from Eisenhower's rather strident Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, uh, as well. Uh, Russell gets another chance to uh, interact with President Kennedy uh, a few years later when he makes a famous public interjection during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, at the height of the crisis, Russell was writing a number of public statements, sending out a lot, number of statements, again trying to pr find a face-saving way for the two kind of powers to back away from the precipice. Um, and again, this is something that gets a public response uh, from Khrushchev uh, as a part of this. And the whole thing is documented in the lovely little book by Russell called Unarmed Victory, uh, which I very much uh, recommend uh, there. Uh, it was uh, at a fa phase when Russell had become very concerned, particularly focused on the United States, thinking that the United States was sort of a, the, the greater danger to world peace at that point, in terms of who is the most likely to provoke the ultimate Armageddon. He saw that as being the United States at that phase, which is not what he thought at the beginning of the Cold War. At the beginning of the Cold War, he very much thought the exact opposite. Uh, he was concerned about the Soviet Union. In fact, he was so concerned about this, and this is something I talk about a little bit uh, in the book, is he was so concerned about this uh, that before the Soviet Union had the bomb, uh, he thought uh, the United States should be willing to resort to nuclear blackmail to, to force the Soviet Union to join into some kind of an international accord to regulate nuclear power. You know, basically, since the U.S. had the bomb, to say, we have the bomb, you don't, you better sign up for this, you know. Um, because he was so concerned about the sort of the danger uh, posed by the Soviet Union. But his opinion kind of turned on this over the years. Uh, Russell has one other chance to be concerned with President Kennedy uh, because after Kennedy's assassination, uh, he joins a group called the Who Killed Kennedy Committee, uh, which is uh, one of these committees, you know, right from the very start that is very skeptical about the, uh, the Warren Commission and their report and wondering, it's like, are we getting the whole story about Kennedy's assassination? Uh, other major figures that enter into Russell's life. Um, well, as I mentioned, Khrushchev on the other side of the Iron Curtain is one of the figures that he interacts with. Uh, he has a much more direct chance uh, 30 years later, uh, 30 years earlier, I'm sorry, uh, to interact with Lenin. Uh, he actually has a chance, unlike most US presidents, uh, Russell has a chance to meet Lenin in person. Uh, right after World War I, uh, Russell um, and a lot of people in the British left are very interested in what's going on in the Soviet Union. And so Russell is invited to join a labor uh, trade union delegation to go to the Soviet Union. And as part of that, Russell gets to travel there. And he is actually the only member of the delegation that gets to have a personal meeting uh, with Lenin. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, sit down with him. Uh, and uh, give, let, gives Lenin a copy of one of his books as a part of that. We have no idea if Lenin read it, uh, but uh, comes away very, very unimpressed by Lenin. Uh, and in fact, it leads him to write uh, another interesting little book called The Practice and Theory of Bolshevism, which comes out, I believe, in 1921. And it's a book where he is uh, very, very critical about what the, so the Soviets are trying to do in, uh, in, in Russia. Uh, at a time when lots of people, including the woman who was about to become Russell's second wife, Dora, this is the same one, the open relationship one. Yeah, that one. Uh, to, uh, uh, who is quite starstruck by the Soviet Union, seeing this like one of, one of the people seeing that as the, kind of the model for the future there. So uh, it causes him a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, troubles. But again, it embodies the idea that uh, Russell was very much committed to this idea of not following a multitude to evil and not automatically joining in on uh, whatever his own uh, group seemed to want him to believe.
There's actually a wonderful line attributed to Russell in his, later in life. Um, uh, he was supposedly having a conversation with one of his secretaries, and his secretary tells the story that Russell said it was always very hard for him to become involved with a political cause because he'd go to a political rally and he'd be listening to somebody having a speech, giving a speech, and inevitably, at some point in the speech, this little voice would come in the back of his mind and would say, well, I don't really believe that. Um, so just, you know, being able to be politically active while maintaining some level of, of critical distance was, I think, one of the things Russell was extremely good at. It's one of the things I think I, uh, is admirable about him and worth, uh, worth keeping in mind. Uh, another uh, major figure uh, to enter into Russell's life. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, he managed not just, he not only managed to meet with Lenin. He did not never met uh, Mao Zedong, but Mao apparently did uh, attend a lecture by Russell. Uh, Russell uh, had spent a year in China. In I believe it was 1922, uh, he was invited to come to the University of Peking to give a series of lectures and uh, teach there. And he gave a public lecture about uh, politics there, which Mao apparently attended uh, there. So uh, and tried to try you know not particularly impressed by, but Mao is grappling with many of the same issues at this time that Russell is grappling with, which is how do you combine, how do you combine a concern with things like socialism with a concern with things like nationalism, for example, and the rising tide of nationalism in the world. So this is something Russell was grappling with. It leads him to write uh, an interesting book called The Prospects of Industrial Civilization, which is a very good book I recommend. Uh, Russell wrote, it's very hard to count how many books Russell wrote because um, there are all kinds of anthologies of his papers and collections of his papers and things like that. So which of those count as books and all. Uh, but it definitely runs well into the dozens, I think, however you count them. I certainly haven't read them all. So there are other political figures uh, worth making note of, uh, and not just politicians and statesmen per se. Some of the connections that he made with people uh, have a bearing on public affairs, even when they weren't with politicians. Russell, for example, is connected to quite a few literary figures uh, over, uh, over time. Uh, personally, uh, he had a uh, personal uh, friendship with uh, Joseph Conrad, for example, uh, after whom he named both of his sons. His sons are named uh, John Conrad Russell and Conrad Sebastian uh, Russell. So uh, very much admired uh, Conrad uh, as a figure. Uh, similar uh, an admiration uh, in many ways for T.S. Eliot. Uh, T.S. Eliot uh, wrote this, uh, actually wrote a poem about him called Mr. Apollinax. If you ever have a chance to check it out, that's very nice. Uh, they met when Russell was visiting uh, Harvard. Uh, it, the relationship goes a little strange because, as you, prob as you probably know, T.S. Eliot was married to a very strange woman uh, named Vivian. Uh, they have a very difficult and complex relationship. One of the turns that relationship takes is apparently Russell sleeps with her at some point, somewhere along the line. Uh, apparently, with Eliot's knowledge, um, if you watch the movie Tom and Viv, Russell appears in there as part of that. He doesn't come across looking very good, but, uh, uh, but it's still, it's a... It's a uh, catalogs well the kind of roller coaster ride of a relationship Tom and Vivian had. Um, a figure with whom Russell had a much more, a literary figure with whom Russell had a much more uh, definite political relationship uh, was D.H. Lawrence. D.H. Uh, Lawrence was somebody that uh, Russell met through his one time lover and muse, uh, Ottoline Morrill, uh, who ran a kind of a salon for a lot of the sort of leading artists and, uh, and writers uh, of the day. And D.H. Lawrence was one of them. And Russell was very struck by him from the very start. And this was during World War I, and both of them were very concerned about the war, and they were very concerned about what could be done about it. Um, and so this led them to come up with the idea of doing a collaborative project. They were going to write a book together. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, so you have the philosophers take on these things, and then you have the, uh, the artists take on these things, and you combine them together. The problem with this project is the fact that Lawrence was crazy. And um, his political views, in fact, were utterly and completely lunatic. Um, and uh, the result is that the book project fell apart very fast. Um, uh, and this leads to a lot of rancor on both sides, uh, in fact. It leads to rancor on, uh, on Lawrence's side. Lawrence actually winds up writing a short story attacking Russell, or Russell is clearly one of the characters in the story. Uh, he writes a story called uh, The Blind Man. 
uh, where there's a uh, rather flippant and pompous uh, self-important guy named Bertie Reed and all of that. So it's a very thinly veiled uh, character. On Russell's part, um, Russell associates Lawrence and his kind of nutty views on politics with uh, the rise of fascism uh, in Europe. And this leads him to uh, talk about Lawrence in, among other things, a wonderful essay he writes called The Ancestry of Fascism, uh, which I would very much recommend. Um, I can't help but mentioning, uh, but quoting one passage from this, uh, this essay because it seems kind of pertinent there. Uh, it's not directly related to Lawrence, it comes later on. He's talking about the rise of uh, fascism in Europe, and in particular he's talking about the, the particular role of, played by right-wing billionaires in the rise of fascism in Europe, which kind of seems pertinent somehow. So maybe I figure, let me, let me quote this to you. Here's his take on, on, on right-wing billionaires and, and their role here. Thus, the irrational elements in the Nazi philosophy are due, politically speaking, to the need of enlisting the support of sections which have no longer any raison d'etre, while the comparatively sane elements are due to the industrialists and militarists. The former elements are irrational because it is scarcely possible that the small shopkeepers, for example, should realize their hopes, and fantastic beliefs are their only refuge from despair. Per contra, the hopes of industrialists and, militists and militarists might be realized by means of fascism, but hardly in any other way. The fact that their hopes can only be achieved through the ruin of civilization does not make them irrational, but only satanic. <laughs> These men form intellectually the best and morally the worst element in the movement. The rest, dazzled by a vision of glory, heroism, and self-sacrifice, have become blind to their serious interest and in a blaze of emotion have allowed themselves to be used for purposes not their own. This is the psychopathology of Nazidom. So, wonderful essay. Uh, I very much recommend to you. It appears in a collection of his essays called In Praise of Idleness. Uh, which is the title essay, that's also a really good essay there, so uh, very much worth checking out these days. Um, since I've made the connection with fascism, I can't help resist uh, mentioning one other uh, in, uh, connection Russell made. Uh, it was when he was, uh, it was, uh, he was contacted by a rather infamous British uh, figure in British politics. Uh, some of you may have heard of Sir Oswald Mosley. Uh, Mosley was uh, effectively the leader of the British fascist movement in the 30s. Uh, it wind, and he winds up getting interned by the British government during the 40s, during the war. I mean, you know, the, uh, had, had Hitler ever invaded Britain, you know, he would have been, I guess, first in line to become Britain's answer to Vidgun Quisling, if you know he was. Um, so, but after the war, you know, Mosley uh, was kind of rather unapologetic about his politics, and in the 60s he writes to uh, Russell and uh, to propose some kind of an exchange of ideas, because Russell, of course, is coming very much from the far left. Uh, his, 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 this is the kind of uh, topic that I think, again, is quite pertinent to this day, so I think it's actually worth quoting Russell's response. The, here's the letter uh, Russell wrote back to Mosley. Dear Sir Oswald, thank you for your letter and your, for your enclosures. I have given some thought to our recent correspondence. It is always difficult to decide how to respond to people whose ethos is so alien and, in fact, repellent to one's own. It is not that I take exception to the general points made by you, but that every ounce of my energy has been devoted to an act of opposition to cruel bigotry, compulsive violence, and the sadistic persecution which has characterized the philosophy and practice of fascism. I feel obliged to say that the emotional universes that we inhabit are so distinct, and in deepest ways opposed, that nothing fruitful or sincere could ever emerge from an association between us. I should like you to understand the intensity of this conviction on my part. It is not out of any attempt to be rude that I say this, but because of all that I value in human experience and human achievement. Yours sincerely, Bertrand Russell. Wow. <laughs> Guy knew how to write. You have to get, say that for him. You know, I mean... I will say one thing about him. I, I wrote a, a review of some of his letters recently, and I called the review Russell Needed to Write, because he was almost compulsive in terms of not just how well he wrote, but how much the man wrote. I mean, uh, they estimate, for example, that Russell must have written something like three letters a day for every day of his adult life, you know, which, again, he may have lived to me 97, so we are talking in the high tens of thousands of letters, probably, over the course of his whole life, many of which we'll never see, of course, because Russell, it's not like he saved a copy of every single one of them, but uh, there's an effort to try to catalog and, and make available the thousands of his letters that do survive. 
Um, so there's more I could say, but I will say, uh, I think it would be probably the best way to conclude would be by pointing one other person in Russell's life, because again, I think it's important for, to understanding uh, his way of relating to politics. And that's one of his um, close compatriots at the time, George Bernard Shaw. As, as a resident of Ireland now, I feel it particularly important to give him a, uh, a bit of a shout out there and all. Uh, there's a very recent uh, biography about him, which I'm told is excellent, by an uh, 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 Irish journalist called Fintan O'Toole. Uh, so if you ever have a chance to check it out, I think it's, um, it's well worth, worth a look. Uh, Shaw is a very interesting figure because Shaw plays a role in British public intellectual life that is very similar to uh, Russell's, of course. Uh, he is a figure um, who is, uh, while he's approaching things as a literary figure primarily, he of course writes an enormous amount about politics, has an enormous amount of public interventions, and like Russell, he's coming at this largely from uh, the left, uh, from an opponent to, of militarism, uh, from a critique of capitalism, many of the same kind of causes. And it led them to be associated with many of the same kind of circles. Uh, but there was one way that I think is, uh, there was always a very big difference between Russell and Shaw. And that's that if you know anything about Shaw's politics, you know Shaw had a weakness for strong men. You know, he had a weakness for the, the, you know, the sort of the great man theory of politics. You know, that politics is affected by the superman. You know, you'll watch any of his plays, you know, a lot of his plays are about these, you know, these gigantic industrialists or other big movers or shakers who are able to do things and make things happen in this world. And unfortunately, that leads Shaw uh, into a kind of an uncritical admiration of all kinds of figures that he sh probably should have known better about. You know, you look at some of the things, for example, he said about Stalin, or you look at some of the things he said about Mussolini, or even some of the things he said about Hitler. Uh, and you're like, uh, yeah, you aren't really paying much attention, are you, George, uh, here? Um, and, uh, and this led him to bump heads with Russell a number of times, because Russell in the 30s, for example, is working in Britain. In Britain, there are a number of, of exiles from the Soviet Union. When like, the show trials are going on and the, uh, the purges are going on, people are getting sent to the gulag. And so he uh, uh, makes a number of in uh, attempted interventions on behalf of people who have a, a husband or who have a father or who have a brother uh, in the Soviet Union uh, who are in danger. Um, and he tries to make use of some of his friends who are uncritical admirers of, uh, of Stalin, like, for example, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, uh, but also George Bernard Shaw, and to try to get their help. And this leads him to bump heads with Shaw quite a few times. And I think that story is worth telling because, again, it emphasizes uh, uh, Russell's ability to um, step back and try to see the bigger picture, to move away from the immediate uh, situation, the moment, and to say, well, all right, you know, whatever the abstract merits of the great man theory of history or that kind of thing, what, uh, what's going on over there? You know, what do the facts tell us about what's going on in the Soviet Union? Uh, let, let, let's get at the facts here. And that's, again, something I think that is uh, sorely needed these days. So I'm just going to conclude by pointing out uh, again, that if you want a reason to take Russell seriously today, I think that one of the best reasons for doing that is because telling the story of Bertrand Russell is a lot like telling the story of modern civilization. I mean, it's, it's one of those stories where when you get into it, you are so connected to so many different topics, and often from a standpoint that can shed a lot of valuable insight into how we ought to approach things today. And so it's a reason for, even though he is almost 50 years gone from the scene, uh, continuing to read him and continuing to take him seriously. So with that, I thank you, and I'll take some questions. Please. Uh, was there a connection with Franklin Delano Roosevelt? That's a good question. Um, uh, the question is, was there a connection between Russell and, and Franklin Roosevelt? Um, not a direct one that I am aware of. Um, Russell was certainly concerned with the debate in the United States over isolationism versus entering the war. And ultimately, he, while he starts from an isolationist perspective, it's one he ultimately repudiates and, and, and gives up on. Um, it leads him to write, for example, a pro-isolationist book called Which Way to Peace, which was the only of his many books that he does never once reprinted during his lifetime, because he completely 
completely repudiates what he says in the book. He admits he, he got that wrong. This was 1936 so that he writes it. It's still an interesting read. I mean, I've read the, read the book, and it's interesting his take on it. Um, but while he was engaged in these public debates, I'm not aware of any direct tie uh, to, to Roosevelt as part of that. Uh, was there any connection to Albert Einstein? Oh, very much so. Uh, connection to Albert Einstein. Um, I, uh, Russell, in fact, reached out to Einstein after world, uh, the Second World War and the rise of the Cold War. Uh, he'd known Einstein already. You know, he had actually, they had corresponded. Russell, in fact, wrote this nice little book, which I still recommend, called The ABC of Relativity, which is a wonderful little introduction to uh, relativity at a, at, a, at a quite, well, I think it's an, 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 uh, accessible because I could understand it, so that's, that's saying something. Um, uh, so they knew each other already. Uh, but, uh, but after the war, Russell reached out to Einstein because uh, he had started to become concerned about the hydrogen bomb and the dangers it posed. And so he proposed a, uh, with Russell, uh, he proposed with Einstein, I'm sorry, to put together a statement and try to attract uh, other leading Nobel laureates in the sciences on both sides of the Iron Curtain to sign it and say, you know, we have a kind of a common interest in uh, preventing Armageddon here. Whatever your politics, in other words, we, we, there is something we very much have in common. And they, they put together the statement together. And it's very interesting what happens with the statement because uh, Russell had sent Einstein the draft of the statement. And uh, he wanted to get, Russell's, uh, get Einstein's take on it. And they were trying to move fast. So Russell fly, is flying to Paris. This is, I think, 1954. And on the plane, uh, th apparently it's announced they'd received the news that Albert Einstein was dead. Uh, and this was like r catastrophic for Russell because he really wanted Einstein's support for this. And, you know, he couldn't obviously release the statement with Einstein's name on it if, I'm, if he'd never had Einstein's approval of the statement. So he gets to his hotel in Paris and there's a letter waiting for him from Albert Einstein uh, saying he was fine with the statement. So uh, the statement goes out as the Russell Einstein uh, manifesto. And it's a wonderful, uh, there's a wonderful passage right at the end. I mean, I, I'm going to probably mangle it, but it's the famous line, um, you know, that uh, uh, we appeal to you as human beings, to human beings, remember your humanity and forget the rest. And uh, that's one of, uh, one of the best lines, I think, to associate with him. And it, but it's a still a wonderful statement, and uh, a lot of interesting things come out of it, including the sort of what are called the Pugwash Conferences, a series of conferences bringing together scientists to deal with leading pub issue issues. So. Uh, to, two items. Uh, he was also active against the Vietnam War as well. Uh, he published statements against that war too, I, I believe. Uh, also, uh, was, he, was there a connection with Ludwig Wittgenstein when Wittgenstein was in England? Oh, absolutely. I mean, take the first point for, uh, that he was actually, one of the bigger things Russell was involved with was with a different major uh, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, Jean Paul Sartre. Uh, the two of them uh, had put together this International War Crimes Tribunal uh, against, uh, uh, against Vietnam. And at that point, Russell was about 94, so he could not physically travel, because I think it was held in Denmark and Sweden. He was not physically up to travel, making the travels for that. But Sartre was, um, was very actively involved with that. And they apparently butted heads quite a lot with Russell's spokesman on the spot. His, his spokesman was this guy named Ralph uh, Schoenman, uh, who is a, still, a, still in the world of Russell studies a bit of a controversial figure. Um, but on, this, on the terms of Wittgenstein, yes, I mean, Wittgenstein actually goes to England, to Cambridge, to study with Russell. Right. Because um, he uh, he gets referred to Russell because he's um, he's interested in the foundations of mathematics. He comes at it from engineering, I guess, which is where he's getting his start. And uh, he comes to Cambridge to work uh, with Russell. He winds up taking a radically different approach uh, from Russell in a lot of ways. And while Russell always had an enormous admiration for Wittgenstein personally, he came to got, got, got rather. Um, unhappy with the directions that he saw Wittgenstein taking uh, philosophy. I mean, the, the so-called ordinary language uh, philosophy. And that leads to a couple of uh, uh, exchanges, not with Wittgenstein, but some of Wittgenstein's disciples. So again, he thinks he thought we're just taking, taking uh, philosophy down the wrong path. Right. I'm, fo I'm, I'm assuming that I'm, I'm supposed to respond to whoever has, gets the mic, so. Hi. Um, could you comment more on the philosophical line? Could you comment a little, if you would like, on um, 
his work, The Problems with Philosophy, and, um, you know, this ever-ending discussion about reality, what seems to be, and what is, and his, um, I think he was kind of supportive of Berkeley and Leibniz, and uh, kind of dismissing metaphysics. Thank you. Well, that's a very huge question, um, and I think I'll try to I'll try to gra grab as much of that as I can here. Um, certainly, uh, Ru Russell, Russell's philosophy goes through a number of very different phases uh, as he develops his thought. Um, when he comes to philosophy for the first time, this is at the height of the influence of Hegel in British philosophy. Um, and the idea that like, you know, there's a kind of a deeper reality that is being reflected that goes beyond the sort of the surface uh, experience that we have. Um, it's a view he ultimately winds up repudiating. Uh, in fact, he writes this wonderful uh, essay which kind of makes his break with British Hegelianism. It's called Seems, Madam, Nay, It Is. Uh, and it's uh, reprinted in his uh, collection, Why I'm Not a Christian, uh, which is uh, it's a, very, it's a fun essay. Um, he comes to, comes to be very, very critical uh, of Hegel and Hegel's entire approach uh, to philosophy. Um, he still probably, he owes a debt to the kind of the idealist tradition in philosophy, not so much to Hegel himself. He thinks dialectics is just a waste of time. Um, but figures like Leibniz are, and Spinoza are both enormously influential to him. He had through his household, I think pretty much throughout his entire life, um, a, a pair of busts of Leibniz and Spinoza. So and given how often he moved, that was pretty impressive that he managed to keep, uh, keep a hold of those. Um, but, uh, and he wrote a whole book on Leibniz, uh, in fact, based on some lectures uh, that he gave. And he always considered Leibniz one of the figures that he knew better than pretty much anyone. Um, and that leads him to be kind of skeptical of the effort to draw a sharp divide between matter and mind. Uh, he's concerned with the, the, the difference between the, the, the so-called mind-body problem. And um, uh, uh, he's for a long time associated with this idea I don't know if it's his, his, his would be fair to call it his mature position, but this idea that if you know what characterizes the world metaphysically speaking isn't properly called mind and it's not properly called matter, it's something else that's kind of mindy sometimes and kind of mattery at other times. Um, we, unfortunately, by the time Russell really starts to develop his mature views in the subject, the philosophy world isn't paying him much attention. You know, he writes his, uh, his last two books, Inquiry into Meaning and Truth uh, in 1940, and Human Knowledge of Scope and Limits, which I think is 1948. And those are both books, uh, in 1948 Russell is 76 years old, um, and at that point, um, even though they're interesting books, uh, the philosophy world isn't paying that much attention to him uh, at that point. So, um, so he probably doesn't have as much of an impact as he could have. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, c c can you say that uh, currently there is uh, some comparable public figure to Russell uh, in uh, terms of philosophy and political influence and uh, the role in our world? Well, the figure I often compare Russell to, and I think it's justified because I know he's an both an admirer of Russell and an honorary member of the Russell Society, is Noam Chomsky. Uh, because Chomsky is, uh, like Russell, a figure who makes a, a, a reputation for deep kind of work in the certain areas in philosophy and science, and then has this kind of other life as a public intellectual figure. And there's one story, I think, that does make the comparison between them quite uh, plain and interesting. Um, during World War I, I mentioned that Russell had lost his passport at one point during the, uh, during the war. Uh, the reason for this is he got, um, he had published a leaflet where um, it was detailing the case of a, someone who had gone to prison for refusing to obey the draft. And uh, the leaflet was distributed in, in England and uh, it was uh, published anonymously. And uh, Russell, uh, one of the guys distributing this leaflet, got arrested and uh, was charged with trying to impede the draft during the war. And Russell published a public letter in the Times. Uh, I, won't, I don't remember the Latin off the top of my head, but the, the, it, was, it basically said, here I am, I did it. It said, if you want to know, uh, I'm the one who wrote the pamphlet. If you're going to come after come anyone, come after me. 
um, which is in fact actually what happened, of course. And it winds, he winds up getting um, uh, a fine from that. And the government uses that as a pretext to deny him a passport. But fast forward to a few years ago, um, one of Russell's book, uh, sorry, one of Chomsky's books is published in Turkey. And it's published, and it makes some very, very critical uh, remarks about the Turkish treatment of the Kurdish people. Uh, and as you know, this is not something that will make you very popular with the Turkish government, either then or now. Um, the publisher is arrested for this. Uh, and at, his, at, at the trial of the publisher, Chomsky actually showed up. And again, his, he was showing up to say, look, I'm the one who wrote it. If you're going to try to put anyone on trial for it, put me on trial, because I'm, I'm the guy who wrote this thing. And the court decided that it did not want to risk the embarrassment of trying to try someone like Chomsky. So it actually it, it dismissed the charges against the publisher for that. So, I mean, I think there is, that, that's a very Russellian kind of move, I think, there, you know, very much being displayed. So uh, I, think, I think it's a natural kind of connection to make. And also, I mean, Ch God, Chomsky is still going, and he's, he turns 90 this year, I believe. So, uh, well, yes. Um, I heard there was a slight disagreement uh, between Einstein and Russell, and the little background and backtrack to what you said about mind matter randomly. Um, Russell it t touched base with quantum theory, and that's why they had a slight disagreement because Einstein couldn't really accept that. Uh, had you heard that? Is that true that there was a slight disagreement with quantum theory? That is possible. Um, I know that Einstein wrote a paper that gets published in, there's this wonderful collection by Paul, Paul Arthur Schilp uh, that comes out in the late 1940s, uh, which includes papers by a lot of leading intellectuals commenting on Russell, and one of the papers is by Einstein. And, um, I, and I have to admit I have not read the paper, but um, it's entirely possible that if they were going to argue about their views on science, that would probably be the most promising place to check for that. Because Russell then responds to all of the papers in the book, except one, and this is the kind of frustrating one, because the one paper he never responds to in that book, it's coming to him from another Princetonian, aside from Einstein, and that's Gödel, uh, Kurt Gödel, um, whom, Ru again, Russell knew uh, somewhat. He's the mathematician. The mathematician, correct. Behind Gödel's incompleteness theorem. That's right. And in fact, there was a recent book published about all, talking about all three of them. It was called 112 Mercer Street, I think. I think it's based on the address. Uh, I think it must have been Einstein's home, actually, there in, in Princeton or something. But anyway, um, uh, so Gödel writes a paper criticizing Russell's views on the philosophy of mathematics. Um, sympathetic criticism of those views, but he gets the paper to the publisher very late, and so when Russell writes his response, he has to say, "Look, I got the paper by Girdle too late to write anything to include it in here, so he just didn't have the time." So we never got to see Russell's response to Girdle there. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, some of the mathematical work that, that Russell did led to what is now known as chaos theory. And I think that gets into the murky realm matter, uh, spirit, and all that kind of thing. So it, 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 and it opens up a lot of things. I mean, one, one uh, slide that was being shown here of, of Russell's comments, which I view as being incorrect, but I think 99% of the people in the room today would agree with him, and that's on the issue of religion. Because my my experience is that being raised in a in a Christian country, people think Christianity is religion. Yes. And if it doesn't do what Christianity does, then it's not religion. Or if it does it, it's all wrong. And and to, to my mind, there's an issue underneath. Religion is comes from a naturalistic dimension. It comes out of human beings, who we are, what we're about. And for me, that, that gets down to the meaning of life. What is the meaning of our life? And at some level, we all answer that question, most of us not in a very clear way, but fuzzy enough that we can get up in the morning, go to work, and do all that kind of thing. And he comments that um, 
religion is, uh, 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 that I'll say it in simple words since I can't repeat his stuff, that religion is, uh, is, is wrong, it's, it's, it's out of the past, it, it's just there, and we're going to move beyond it. And I think that's the mistake that we've currently made where we're not able to recognize religion does something critical. It, it performs in the realm of what is the meaning of life and every person needs to answer that question, but we don't try to answer it because we think we know the answer. Um, that's a lot of stuff you put on the table. Uh, let, me, I mean, let me talk about two bits of that, I think. One of them is that um, Russell was definitely very critical of attempts. I'm not sure if, I'm not sure I associate, I'm not sure of the connection with chaos theory. I do know he is, he's definitely suspicious of attempts to draw religious meaning out of things like quantum physics and that kind of thing. And in fact, he's, he's very critical of people, I think, like, for example, his former uh, colleague and, and mentor, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who I think he thinks are trying to draw mystical kind of conclusions out of the, uh, modern science. In fact, there's a one, and wonderful line from the uh, elderly Alfred North Whitehead about them, because uh, 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 there was someone, uh, a philosophy student interviewing Whitehead uh, in his old age and asked him about, like, why is it that uh, the, two, the two of them did not collaborate further after they finished their magnum opus in the philosophy of mathematics, uh, Principia Mathematica? And Whitehead's answer was, Bertie thinks I'm muddle-headed. <laughs> Well, I think he's simple-minded. <laughs> and um, I think a lot of debates that happen in the humanist world around, uh, around religion could kind of fit in there somehow, you know. Um, but um, it, Ru Russell, Russell writes over the course of uh, 85 years, probably, um, an enormous amount about religion. And some of it... Some of it is treating it purely as a barbaric superstition. And a lot of it is just about how the word is defined. As you know, this is this kind of endless game about how you define the word. But, um, but uh, he is, uh, there are times when he tries to identify sort of the kernel in religion that he's more sympathetic to. He has an essay called The es uh, Essence of Religion, I know, which he does, uh, which is included in a lot of the standard collections. There's a couple of collections of Russell's writings on religion, and it would definitely be in there. He's probably at his most sympathetic when he's with Adeline Morrill, his, fir his first of many mistresses, I guess you could say, call her. Um, and she was a definite muse uh, for him. And, but she had a very strong mystical streak in her, uh, her uh, personally. And um, Russell actually tried very hard to find uh, were there common grounds between what she believed and what he believed. And he, and he was looking at ways to think about that. And it leads him to write one of the most god-awful, horrible short stories ever written. I mean, if you want... There's this short story he writes it's called The Perplexities of John Forstus, which is about this guy who has this existential crisis, and he goes and consults with a philosopher, and he goes and consults with a scientist about it, and oh, God, it's turgid. It's just... He writes an incredibly good... He actually writes some very good fiction, I would have to say. If you want a wonderful collection of short stories, he wants one called The Nightmares of Eminent Persons, which is wonderful. But, uh, you know, th this was a much earlier, and it's a much more serious and heavy-handed story, and God, it's plotting as anything, so... But he was very much, you know, this is something where, depending on which phase of Russell's life you read, you're going to see some, some views which are much more trying to find what can be distilled from it, and much more kind of, this is a waste of time, so... Well, time's up for Q&A. Uh, let's give the speaker a great hand. Thank you.